Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to another installment of Crisis Currency Roundtable. We started off with Crisis Currency Conversations, but we have now pivoted into, and let me just get rid of that. Um, and we are now the Crisis Currency Roundtable. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you have been participating, we've been doing this for the past, this is episode 10. I'm excited about this episode because I get to bring some of my favorite friends who do some amazing work in music. And so I hope that you will continue to listen to our episodes, subscribe to the channel, on YouTube at Larvetta L. Lofton. Again, my name is Larvetta Lofton. I'm the founder of the L3 Agency, and I am excited to bring this installment of Crisis Currency Roundtable. Every time I start, I start off with what makes me, what brings me joy, because in this crisis, you know, it was difficult and challenging to cope with what we were dealing with. And so for me, I was supporting black businesses and purchasing products. And one of them is my girl, who you guys are get to see today, um, is Kiana KJ Henson, The Rose Effect. I got her book. I made a lot of purchases to books. So if you get a chance, purchase her book for business leaders, you know, looking to bring your best and perform at your best, this book is dynamite. So while she is in the music industry and has been um, so dynamic and vital to so many different artists and you'll get to hear from her, the most important thing is that what she's been able to do is pivot and to provide a, you know, this book for those who want to perform even as speakers, um, perform, you know, in their companies as CEOs. And so I think it's a dynamite um, book. So please, please support her and hear from her. So without um, further ado, I get to introduce um, my friends, my colleagues, and, you know, they're from Chicago and that's where we are headquartered in Chicago. So I'm going to go in order of name. So I'm going to go with, I think, Jay, Vince, so I'm going to start off with my girl, Kiana. I'm going to introduce her. So give her some love as we introduce her to um, the stream. Kiana, hello. hello. How are you, mama? Thank you so much for having me. It's funny because I know when people say Kiana, then they we go back. We go pre-New York, pre-LA. <laughs> so, yeah. I know, and I have to keep reminding myself, KJ, KJ, like I'm still it's fine. No, okay. no, it puts it puts me back in my place. Okay, if I ever had a moment, I go back. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. So for those that are listening, guys, it's KJ, but you know I do know her as Kiana, so you will hear me say that um, quite frequently. Um, next we have is Michael Graham, um, who is a amazing choreographer and uh, I think we're going to we're gonna really get a, an opportunity to really learn more about who he is and what he's doing in this world in this space of the arts because music arts dance I mean you name it and then um, music and DJ you're gonna hear from um, DJ Vince Adams because I think it is important that we have this conversation so let me bring um, my boy my brother Vince Adams up to hold on one second um into our round table discussion hey Fizz. what's up ll good to see hey, you man. big mike i'm so excited and, um, and i'm just gonna tell on kiana i've been her since she was 14 years old so she's kiana to me all day <laughs> <laughs> and that was just that was just seven years ago absolutely, so, right. absolutely. <laughs> It was, it was, Kiana, I'm, I'm right with you. I'm right you. with you on that. So thank you guys for saying yes uh, to the another installment of Crisis Currency Roundtable. It was started um, as a way for me to be able to serve the business community on ways to pivot in this crisis. And so I know that we're dealing with obviously the pandemic, but we also have a dual crisis, right? We're dealing with racial injustice. So we never want to, you know, not talk about that. So that's also something that I want to make sure is the forefront. But before we get started, um, for those that are tuning in with us, let's just go around the room 
and just tell me, you know, what's, you know, tell me who you are, but tell me your first encounter into the arts. Because I think that's important for people to understand that, you know, because we're talking about pivoting. So kind of your first encounter into the hearts and, to, and just where you are today. So um, I'm going to start off with Mike. Okay. Mike? Um, my first encounter with the arts is probably when I was about, yeah, <laughs> my first encounter with the arts was probably when I was about seven years old. I grew up on um, most music and I'm especially Michael Jackson as well. Um, so music, I definitely got introduced to music within my household at a very early age. Um, dancing, for sure. I always watched dancing movies growing up as a kid. Michael Jackson is definitely my inspiration. I want to go into the arts because I looked up at him just because he was a performer. Um, but he was also doing a lot of stuff all around. So that's definitely where I got my first taste of the arts. And when I started doing my first performance, I was probably like 11 or 12. That's definitely what made my love for the arts. Okay. And so now my, I think you might have to come a little closer to your computer. I don't know why, but we're getting, we can't all the way hear you. So I don't know if it's based on the mic. I don't know why. Um, but I believe you said your first encounter was at seven, right? Was seven years old? Yes, yeah, seven years old. Okay, mm -hmm. seven years old. Wow. And so you've been dancing ever since seven and teaching others yeah. how to dance. Yes, ma'am. Yep. And you have a special yes. gift around the special needs, right? And helping those who have special yes. needs. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So my older sister, uh, my sister Imani, she has Down syndrome. Um, so me and my sister are only about a few years apart. So we grew up like this um, consistently in our household. Um, that's also where I got my protection of black women from because my dad was always like, make sure you protect your sister, watch out for your sister. You know, mm -hmm. so um, the main reason I advocate for children who have disabilities so much is because I have firsthand experience because I have a sister that I protect who I want to see. Because my sister's already faced with intersectionality because she is a black woman, but she's a black woman with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely the main reason like I go even harder to bring like an advocacy for children with special needs is because of my sister. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's incredible. Oh. And he's so flexible. I mean, I watch his videos on TikTok, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So, KJ, tell yes. us about you and how, you know, your first encounter into the arts. It's interesting because I went to um, Emmanuel Christian School on 83rd and Damon, um, and there we had these chapel programs every Friday. And I think even though I had this level of stage fright, I was still participating. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, I was still, um, you know, we had to do uh, recite Bible verses and we had to participate in, in plays. And, and I think that was when I first kind of understood that there is something about outward expression and the projection of whatever your gift is. And then I was on the chilling team and then from there the pom-pom team. And, and so I was like, I'm supposed to be doing something in movement. I just didn't know how it would all translate because I feel like, you know, I grew up in a very pragmatic household where you go to grammar school, you go to high school, you go to college, you get your degree and, and that's it. And so we were a lot further from the, you know, the Broadway musicals, a lot further from the Hollywood lights. And so for me, I just thought maybe it was a hobby. So from uh, being in, you know, uh, the Soul Children of Chicago, uh, where I started kind of understanding that there was a voice in me, um, that just helped to build my courage and my confidence even more. From there, I sang at Trinity United Church of Christ uh, in the choir as well, and then went to FAMU. And so at FAMU, you know, of course the dancing was like inherent. I mean, I'm listening and going to dances parties. I think one time I did a, somebody tried to battle me and I think I did a, a backflip. <laughs> and so, you know, I just realized that part of my expression and the fact that uh, God was using me as a vessel um, in the arts, and that's really where it started. From fam, the Deltas were like, we think we need somebody to sing at this event. I was like, let me get somebody. They said, I think it's you. And so it always took someone else saying, hey, I see something in you, um, as opposed to me asserting myself very early on. From there, I moved to New York um, and was put with managers by a guy named John Platt, uh, and they helped me hone my skills and helped me understand, again, that I didn't have to ask permission to actually just display and exhibit this gift that I had. And, and then from there, I was like, okay, I've got something. Kelly Price put me on tour with Puff. I ended up singing with Heavy D, Biggie, 
A Z A plus, all these singers, and then I understood that every uh, with every opportunity, I was being expanded. I was stretching beyond my perceived capacity, and so one day God was like, "Okay, that's it. You did it." And now I need you to move in something else. So very early on, I understood that the artist in me was the talent, but the assignment in me is the coach. Um, and so I started, you know, kind of taking that and pouring into other artists, helping them to understand that there is something about your internal narrative first that has to be reconciled before you can uh, project your external expression to anybody because we want to believe it. So it's got to be honest. Mm -hmm. And so that's what led me to kind of what I am working as today, which is a perform artist performance and development coach. Yeah. And I love that yeah. you just, I mean, because we're talking about pivoting. I love how it just evolved and pivot. And so you're now planted in a seat that you're act actually able to plant seeds to help people to advance their career. So I think that's powerful, Kiana. Now, I, I, and don't let me, don't get me wrong. It wasn't easy. I wasn't like, oh, mm. I should do this now. <laughs> I mean, like it took me, number one, it took me 10 years to validate my own project to yeah. say I should be an artist. Thank you. You know, Thank so, you for saying it takes time because Sometimes it takes time. Like, oh, it does. And, and, it, and yeah. it doesn't matter what other people um, think about it. It took me the 10 years to stop um, uh, vacillating between whether I should be the messenger for this body of work or not. And yeah. so it was, I found myself going to ARs and they would say, oh, well, why don't you try it this way? So it's like the more opinions you ask, the more you find yourself doing some adjustments and then forgetting what the origin of your message was in the first place. Yeah. So it took me that amount of time to figure out that I belong and that I was already uh, qualified to walk in that assignment. Yeah. So I think a lot of times it doesn't matter what other people's uh, thoughts about it would be if we haven't figured out why we should be doing it in the first place. That's good. So. Thank you for saying that, Kiana. Thank you. Um, my brother, DJ Vince Adams, I want to um, pose that question. Like, where did you, and I certainly know this story too, but certainly want to let people know, like, your first, um, you know, kind of encounter into DJ. And I do think there is an art behind it. Um, it's a tremendous art to, to be able to do that because you too pivot and, and worked in IT. So if you can just um, let people know kind of that and how you how you, how it, you encounter that. Yeah, I mean, I'll just give you the, uh, the, the surface story uh, and then however deeper you want to dive from there is cool. I'm going to tell on KJ a little bit. <laughs> I've got this footage. I've got this footage in storage somewhere. Um, and Angie Malden remembers this. Um, oh, of, Jesus. Of Kiana doing You Remind Me by Mary J. Blige. I've got it on VHS from school. <laughs> it's storage. I got to dig that out. But the performer that he is today, I'm telling you, this was her, you know, I can't get the image because then, you know. But Yes, thank you. <laughs> you know it's all family, Michael. But, but, but all, all of the grandness that you see is the world. And, 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 and at, very, at a very early stage in her career. So for me, I, I'll go all the way back to the beginning. I've never shared this before. Uh, my mom said, you used to crawl out of your crib as a baby and go climb the fireplace to touch the record player. And that's what mm. they called it back in the seventies, the record player or the, you know, the stereo. Yeah. And um, my very first record player, if you will, was a thing called a closing play, giving away my age, just turned 50 yesterday. And Happy birthday again. Happy birthday, yes, man. <laughs> Well, a hold and play was where you could put a record in, you close it, and the needle goes. And and my very first record was Love Machine by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, if I'm giving anything away. That was the very first <laughs> record that I, that I ever played. But I was raised by three women who all had three different styles and sensibilities of music. So my aunt, was she was the funk. She liked Rick James, Parliament, you know, the Ohio Players. You know, my mom was like... The smooth and the jazz. She liked Earth, Wind, and Fire, Isley Brothers, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, things like that. And then my grandmother was, you know, the Natalie Cole, um, the Bobby Blue Bland, you know, um, you know, Quincy Jones. So I got all of these influences. So when I'm with one person, I'm listening to one thing. With another, mm -hmm. I got this wide appreciation for music. And then my mom's revolutionary. So I'm going to these revolutionary events with you know darshikis and bongos and you know 
and kufis and bean pie, you, you name it, you know, falafels. I'm eating falafels in the 70s before we. <laughs> well, um, you know, so my point is, is that without even getting into the DJing, and you asked when was my first exposure like to music, it really was this wide um, dynamic I was exposed to, which I don't think kids get today. That's the reason right. I share that story. Everything is whatever goes in their ears, that's all they know. And anything that happened before the year 2000, like, didn't exist. Uh, you know, all of us grew up with our parents, with our grandparents' music, and we were introduced to the art mm -hmm. in that manner, as opposed to, you know, kids telling, you know, us, like, that ain't music or, or whatever. And it's because uh, we didn't have a choice. If we were in the car with them, we were listening to their FM station, not they had on one thing and we had on another. So, you know, that I just wanted to, to share that because that's a generational thing. It's not uh, just something I experienced. I'm sure, you know, anyone over the age of 40 has tried to have the, you know, hey, how do you like this? And it's like, if it didn't happen, it didn't, you know, it didn't happen during their day. It, it yeah. didn't exist. And so I just wanted to share that that was my earliest exposure. And let me say this, I think the early, and I really like to shape that because sometimes how we start off or grow up, you know, isn't always how we end up. And we're still, we're still evolving. Like even today, we're still evolving. Making people to understand that while we're in this pandemic, um, there's an opportunity for all of us to pivot in this crisis. And I truly believe that there is growth in adversity, that there is so much opportunity in adversity. So I want to talk about crisis. I want to talk about it because we do have dual crisis going on. But prior to this crisis, how you know, have you both, I mean, all of you all are entrepreneurs. All of you all are leading um, businesses in the arts. And so I know, Mike, you're, 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 you're young and vibrant and, and certainly I love that. Um, and I am too, right? Right, Kate? You Thank right? you. Um, I know, I know. But we recognize that, you know, Mike is young and this might be his first crisis, right? But I want to say for, you know, Vince and, 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 um, Kiana, you know, how did you cope with crisis? Um, I know in your book, Kiana, you talk about it a little bit um, in the book. And so, you know, how did you handle that, Vince? Like, this is a pandemic. We know this is something we've never seen. But how did you cope with crisis that you face as an entrepreneur? Um, two things. One, I think that I can speak for Kiana. Again, not giving away her age. I always like to <laughs> Put, put that in there. But we've been we've been independent artists for over a decade. I'll put it like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, Larvetta, mm. as you know, a entrepreneur, you have incredible days, horrible mm -hmm. days, incredible months. Oh my God, months. Like you know, you you have. So I think that when you're not used to those swings, because you kind of find your middle ground. At some point, you get to the point where you're like, I can't go this far to it's great. And I can't go to, you know, this far. It's horrible. I've got to find my middle ground. So I think that yeah. as you start to put that into your personal energy, when you have these things that are happening in the world, they don't affect you to the same extremes. You're aware of them. But now that you've got your centering as a person, it might not affect you the same as a person that's been in the same career with three different employers for the last 20 years. Like yeah. they're used to a certain level of stability <laughs> where when you kind of, you know, eat what you kill, what you call in the industry, you, you're you used to instability. Yeah. So when, when I saw everything that was happening in Corona, when I saw everything that was happening, you know, with George Floyd, I didn't panic, but I said, I've got a platform. And a lot of people out here, their energy is kind of scattered. What is it that I can do with my platform to give people on some end, some relief, on some end, some solace, you know. Therapy, different. it was me. My Absolutely, I mean, because, because you know, art is therapy for the artist as well as for the recipient of the mm -hmm. art oftentimes as well. So um, one of the things that I did is I created a, a healing house rally, which was a virtual house rally with some hip hop on the back end as well. But I just wanted the energy of positivity to kind of like permeate throughout what I was doing, whether you're on your phone, whether you're on your laptop, whether you're on your big screen, I wanted you to feel some peace because there were some people that weren't going to go pro protest. You know, I'm, you know, the the average age and beyond me and my family is 70 years old. 
So I'm very cognizant of me and, you know, being a carrier or anything else. So I wasn't about to physically go out and protest. But what is it that, that I can do for all of those people that wanted to express themselves? I created a healing house rally. Mm -hmm. So I don't you know, I, I certainly want to spread this topic. But that that's kind of my feeling is that one, I was personally centered to then be able to say, well, how can I use my platform to create some some peace uh, for others? Nice. That's good. Um, Kiana, mm. do you want to add on, you know, previous yeah. experiences? I know you talk about it in the book, you know, and how when this when this happened, you know, how did you cope through it? Yeah, I think um, for me, uh, crisis equates to perspective, you know, like where what you think, number one, about uh, what you thought about yourself before the crisis. Right. Because if you did not have a level of faith or courage or confidence in your offering, because during a, a crisis, everyone has something to contribute. And so what I realized is, you know, it took me two years to write the book. Um, and, and I had no idea that God was preparing it for a time like this when people were sitting at home left to their own devices, unsure, uncertain of how to move. No longer are you surrounded with people that you can attach your dream onto. You are left to center yourself and to figure out what God needs you to do and how you move forward for yourself. And so I just, I, I didn't think that the book would be a tool for those people at that time, at this time. And so what it made me understand was your, your contribution or your offering does not have to be this grand gesture. It is taking whatever you were assigned, taking whatever your, your, special gift is and contributing that. That could be prayer. That could be calling a friend and uplifting them. For me, it was uh, getting on IG Live and interviewing and talking and, and, and feeling people's trauma and allowing them the space and the platform to talk about it. Um, I recently partnered with Ayala Van Zandt and Tina Lifford. They have a podcast called Love From A Distance and it allowed me to talk to other artists and see how they are using kind of what they have to add value to the people, to heal the people, to give a sense of therapy as, as Vince has been doing. Dance therapy has been what I've gotten from him and I think that as a vessel, you have to refuel right and so my refuel came from dancing with vince so then it gave me what i needed to be able to pour into other people that feel like they are lost that feel like they have nothing to offer and so what i, I say to people uh during this process as we talk about pivot um pivoting just means that you you've assessed the information right no longer is it serving you or serving the people that are assigned to you and now you just have to make some new adjustments mm -hmm. and i think a lot of times people are afraid to pivot because they think that the the work that they put it in the past no longer works right it doesn't discount your efforts in the past it doesn't say that you're a failure it just means that you were conscious enough you were aware enough to collect the information needed to make the adjustments so that you can continue to serve the people and so i think um where i was always in the studio working with artists this pushed me it helped me to push beyond what my perceived capacity was mm -hmm. so that i could penetrate the lens because that's really what you have to do now when vince is playing when mike is dancing you've got it you can't touch him Right. So you've got to penetrate the lens now until you can get to person to person. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's like I remember I was given uh, an opportunity to speak at the National Child Development Association. And I said, well, what's the age range of the kids? And they said, we'll probably start at four. And I was like, I don't think what I do talks to four year olds. But you best believe I had to sit over here and figure out how can I keep the four year olds engaged, but not make the, the 12, 13 year olds feel like it, they're not included in this. Mm -hmm. So it stretched me. You know, whatever I thought about myself before the pandemic, it stretched me to think further. It stretched yeah. me to go higher yeah. and think of ways to reach people. And I could not get comfortable. And I think, you know, the civil unrest, if it's told us nothing else, it's that we all have something to do. We all have something to say. We all have to understand that it comes internally first. Otherwise, you're just speaking and it's surface, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, it's not landing. And I, so I want to make sure that what I do uh, lands. I want to make sure that the people that I work with, they're making it count. And yeah. it starts with what you think about yourself. It starts with the old, your own vulnerability first. And yeah. I think that's what where the struggle is. If you yeah. have a problem being vulnerable, uh, then you're not dealing with the trauma in an, in an honest way, in a healthy way. And so I think every day as that, I ask that of others, but I also have to make sure that I'm making a conscious effort to exude my vulnerability as well. And so that's what this has been for me. Yeah. Uh, the, 
Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up vulnerability. Um, Mike and I were talking about that earlier today. So I think it's just a point that we were talking about. Um, and I, I'll, I'm going to come back to that, OK? Um, mm -hmm. Because I think it's an important thing that I want to bring up. But I want to ask Mike before I get into um, vulnerability, because he brought that up this, this earlier today when we were mm -hmm. talking. Um, Mike, I want to talk about um, the crisis. So obviously, you know, you've launched um, and you you have been launching a number of videos on TikTok and, and and dance movements. And so how has this pandemic for you, right, um, being, is this your first crisis for yourself or do you feel like you've experienced other crises? Because let me, let me ask this. You, you might have experienced crisis. I don't know. Um, being a young black man, like in America, is kind of just an everlasting crisis um, mm. that I'm always going to have to deal with. But it's not a crisis that I'm going to let you down. Um, I can definitely say, like, I've had my own personal crises before. Like, of course, I've always like, dealt with depression, stuff like that, you know. Um, but I've also been able to, like, push through that and, like, work on healing myself as well, as well as, like, improve my relationship with God. For sure. Um, I would definitely say, like, with me using this platform, this crisis definitely gave me more time to do that because I'm a college student. Um, I was still in my spring semester when um, this crisis really kicked off mm -hmm. um, and everything got switched to online classes. So immediately that was kind of tough because I'm taking I was taking 12 credits in um, college and my spring semester math class at that. And I was taking English classes where we had to write like about 12 to 14 page papers. Um, so it definitely it wasn't a joke um, in terms of that, especially just having to adapt. Um, but as well, like when it came to just TikTok, the world went out of control, schools went out of control. But then I see on this platform that has over a billion users that you see black men and like dudes my age who look just like me who are dragging women. And so for me, I didn't like seeing that like at all, especially with the fact that I'm pro black. Um, I have a black mother. I have a black sister. I have two black sisters and I have a black father and they've all been impacting my life. So therefore, what makes it right for you to drag black women on the internet and then praise white women and uplift them instead? So for me, I created a safe space. Um, the first thing I did, I said, this is a safe space for black people all complex. Um, I don't hold any black women of any different complexion higher than the other. Um, so for me, I just started making like wholesome TikTok content. And um, it seemed like immediately, even though it took its time to build up, eventually it blew up. Um, over the course of four months. So I went from having about maybe 5,000 followers to 103,000 now um, as of like two or three days ago. And it's like the best thing is DMs that I get and the comments that I get because it's a very wide range of black women that my content goes to because I have some people there like I had a woman she was like this helped my daughter. Her confidence has gone up so much since she's seen mm. the page. I'm not just praising black women, but I'm educating people as well. I'm educated on black history. I'm an activist. So therefore, it, would, it wouldn't be right for me not to use my platform. Like, I'm consistent in everything that I do. Even with music that I release or any raps I release, everything is pro-black. I'm meant to teach. Like, I'm using my voice as a vessel to teach, not just to bring attention to myself. Mm -hmm. Like, that's that'd be selfish. Yeah. So yeah. definitely for me, um, this crisis and everything that's going on, like, there's a silver lining in everything. Like. If this crisis hadn't gone on, I probably wouldn't be affecting people's lives on this big of a scale like I am now, in all mm -hmm. honesty. Um, so even though like everything's going out of control right now, like I still got to realize to keep myself centered and I still got to keep myself strong, not only for the people around me, but for the people I'm influencing. Um, so definitely um, the crisis is like, even though it's bad, like I got to look at it from a certain perspective, like I still got a purpose. You know, yeah. like, I can't Amen. just like curl up in a ball everything is like going out of control like i don't have that option like, i don't have that luxury to do that like i'm still building myself as a brand like, i'm still mm -hmm. building myself as a person yeah. therefore if i'm stopping just because the world seems like it's going out of control and the world is always going to be out of control, like what do i look if something's going bad in my life and i just want to stop like, it's no reason for me to i can't afford it and i'm not going to Thank you, Mike. I mean, I just want to say that I love that you said it's an everyday crisis as a black man. Um, I thought that was very important because we need for the business community to really understand that because the, the reason why I wanted to do this is to help business leaders understand that 
you know, for, for black entrepreneurs and black business leaders, we are, we are infected with crisis every day. We can't have access to capital. We can't, um, we, we don't have the same business opportunities. It's not equitable. And so that's it. So I want to really, really get into what I know to be true is for our business, we hire entertainment. Like we hire entertainment. That's what we do. We hire DJs, we hire musicians, we hire dancers because these brands want to what? Activate something and engage in culture. So we understand that. And because we do that, what I want to make certain happens is that what does that look like today, right? What does that look like when we package something and we want to present this to these brands on how can and I know I'm I'm gonna um, I'm I'm gonna go to 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 um to Vince because I think one of the things that he and I were talking about is his twist of of adding you know this element of technology and what you guys know is that you know technology as it becomes for Black people there's a digital divide you know in some communities they don't even have Wi-Fi. Um, in black communities. And so we still are talking to me, we're still not at this, we, it's not fair. And so Vince, I wanna talk to you about specifically talking about how business leaders can engage, how they can fundraise using um, you know, this virtual DJ platform that you have, how can businesses can do um, sales meetings to inspire their teams, you know, what can be done, or maybe it's as simple as, you know, let's take it down low. Maybe it's the anniversary party, or maybe it's the baby shower, whatever it is, you want some kind of celebration component and you want to have this DJ. So I want you to share you know, I know you've got this new twist and it is dynamite um, in what you do to really create an experience for people while they're at home or wherever they are. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate you, you directing that to me, because here's what I'll say. When the whole COVID thing went down, I had just come back from from Mexico. The following weekend is where all the chaos broke out in the uh, customs lines and that sort of thing. And I was like. I told Kalila, uh, my fiance, I was like, this thing is not going away anytime soon. Like not going away <laughs> till like August. And she was like, August, I mean, just think about it, March. I was like, August at the earliest, people will not be going to clubs. And she was like, are you serious? I was like, everything shut down. Conventions shut down, meetings shut down. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is, this is not like when we get a cure, when we get a vaccine, this is a behavioral thing. And mm -hmm. the country is too divided for everybody to do the same thing at the same time to force to, to get things right. I mean, I saw that yeah. in March. So my thought relative to what I could do, my undergrad is from FAMU in, in the School of Business. My master's is from DePaul. <laughs> FAMU graduates. Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's too much rattless in here. It's too yeah, many yeah. rattless up in here. Mad. I love y'all. <laughs> so my master's is all in business information systems, not programming, but how you know technology is used for business. That's where my master's is. And so my background is, is corporate project management. I threw all of that together to say over time, we will build an acceptance to the fact that you will now enter events through your computer, through your phone, through your tablet. But over time, this won't happen right away because people are slow to adopt technology and things. But what will happen during that is I will continue to introduce new ways for people to interact with the technology and I'll just build it over time. So here's where, where I see it going long term. I'm company or organization XYZ. I traditionally have a gala or an event that attracts 300 to 400 people. What that usually takes is $10,000 at least for the venue, a certain amount for the catering, a certain amount possibly for security, valet, coat check, you name it. There's like, let's say $40,000 in expenses that could come along with organization or company XYZ having this event, event planners, budget as well, things of that nature. What is it that I can do that says, hey, let me partner with the event planner and we shape a virtual experience? Two things happens. If it was a fundraiser, your goal is to raise funds. Well, you've now saved 
a significant amount of that 40,000 that unfortunately it's not we're taking it away from anyone. The same right. power yeah. is there. It just has to circulate in a different place. So it's not like, hey, don't go to the Elysian or don't go to the Wardorf. Come to me. The Wardorf isn't open for business for what it is you do. Hmm. You've got to go somewhere. So very succinctly, if you don't have those same expenses, now you've got a smaller, you know, uh, outlay of expenses. But now instead of those three to 400 people that you used to be able to get physically, what if you promote it to the world? What if you promote it beyond your city, beyond your, beyond the part of the country you're in? And you can attract, if your company is in Indiana, you can attract people from California, Washington state, Florida, you can attract all of these people. So now you can have a thousand people in your virtual event for less money, but give them a virtual experience. That can't just be no disrespect to D nice because everybody, no disrespect, but that can't just be a thousand people looking at one guy playing music. There has to be another dynamic behind that. So that's where I came up with the text scrolls, the, the slideshows, the interplay with the chat room. There, it's an entire experience that's now being built where now you're in your living room, you're in your basement, you're in your backyard, like, oh my God, I'm at the party. So, you know, I think that KJ couldn't have put it better when she said, well, you have to reach beyond the lens. That's where we are right now, where this virtual thing is not going away anytime soon. Even when we do incorporate events of over a hundred people or more, there will still be a place for this. Now, to, to answer your question relative to companies and organizations, they can embrace it. The biggest mistake that I've seen from a company or organization is going about it tentatively. There is no power in tentative. Everything you do, you have to do with a purpose. So if people said, man, I should have promoted that harder, or man, I should have done that on a larger scale because it was a success, go into it understanding that you're now creating a new paradigm. You're now creating a new way for people to connect. And you can be the trailblazer as opposed to the follower once everybody adopts it because it's not going anywhere. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad that you gave that perspective because that's something, you know, even as us leaders, we're trying to help, you know, our clients understand that this is good and we can continue to create an experience um, without us having to have that that large bill of other costs. But we can spend it in technology and we can spend it in black technology. I'm going to say that again, that we can invest in higher um what I call you all as content creators, because you are um, black content creators, that we can put money into them and they can help us create that experience. So thank you. Um, Kiana, I'm going to come over to you because the one thing that I want to talk to you is that now we're all on video. So we got to come with our best game. Like we got to put our whole face together from mm -hmm. our up to make sure that we are either what selling in a new business opportunity, or perhaps we are maintaining a relationship or we're empowering a team, whatever yeah. that be, it's an important element that we have to have. And so what I'm coming to you is I know that you work, you know, with musicians, but you also work with, you know, people that are in front and leading teams and are influential in their own right. And so given the fact that um, I love that you said, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really now about the lens is helping these business leaders and entrepreneurs to be able to come and bring their best self to be able mm -hmm. to maintain their business presence. So I wanted to talk to you about how have you been able to help? Is that something that, you know, could be a, you know, as a, as a pivot to help everybody? Because there's a lot of people that don't know how to get on a video. It's like, oh, my gosh, I'm getting on a video and they're panicking. So have mm -hmm. you that? And so helping those that really are nervous about showing their their face um, in meetings or, you know, in teams environment or routine environments. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it did take me a minute to, um, I would say, adapt. Right. So I had a Microsoft workshop scheduled a conference scheduled March 6th in New York. Um, they had already bought 600 books. I was just coming back from Morocco when the, the murmurs of this was happening and then they canceled it and they were like, well, why don't we do, you know, like, why don't we just do a virtual uh, meeting? I was like, nope, I, I, I don't work like that. 
That's not how I do it. I have to be, I have to be there. I want you to feel this energy. And, and so, you know, I was just like, yeah, this will be over soon. And then, you know, in fact, they rescheduled me for October. That was, this is the plan. Hopefully there's still the plan. Um, and so it took me a minute to understand that again, I could not move tentatively in this, right? Because if you are a vessel, there's a responsibility for you to understand that people are relying on your gift to help them in the midst of all of this, right? So I had to think fast. And I would I couldn't say that the that I would have probably put the book out before because I was also moving in this timid timidity, this tentative spirit of like, okay, when the time is right. And God was like, the time is right now, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and and once I started to think that it's bigger than me. Like people are sitting and trying to figure out what they offer. And I believe that that's what I wrote the book from. It's to help people to occupy their space, whatever their discipline is. Mm -hmm. I work with artists of all disciplines. So I don't care if you're an artist in the boardroom. I don't care if you're the artist on the corner, the traditional stage, the untraditional stage, wherever you occupy space, that is your stage. And so I had to reimagine my stage in this what? form so that I can help to push other people in their own. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say, you know, the first couple of weeks, it was like I did this campaign of doing, let me tell you my first, um, I would say IG Live was with Tadra Mitchell, all these family ones, Tadra and Jamise and their daughters, um, because each of them are in the arts. And so I had done all of my research, I was ready. And then I got on and then uh, I think towards the end, someone said, can you pull that picture up a little bit more? Can you come forward? I came forward, the whole desk fell over, the computer closed. And I was like, the old me would have been like, that's all folks, you know? But I was like, the recovery time, you know? And, and not just the recovery in that, but I think that we've all got to recover quicker, you know? And we we have the right to feel and, and, and because what we do is really a condition of the heart, no matter what you do. I, all the TikToks, and it's funny because I've partnered with TikTok to do motivational videos, which I don't necessarily like myself on video. So, what to your point, it is I've got to, I had to get comfortable first, right? Understanding that the message was bigger and my feelings would catch up. You know, <laughs> they would catch up. So, uh, TikTok gave me an opportunity to do 15 seconds of motivational speaking on whatever I wanted to talk about. Um, and initially I was just like, I, was, I wasn't I was anti-TikTok, I just don't like choreographed dancing. I was like, I like the freestyle. I don't like to do a big thing. <laughs> and so when they offered me this, they were trying to expand all the verticals and I fell into the motivational vertical that they have. And so, um, and now it is, once you take the focus, and it's also the preparation, right? If you are getting on and you're just trying to wing it, if you're good at that, then great. So most of what the content that I'm I'm sharing with my clients is that the preparation would knock out 85% of the nerves, right? Because you actually have something that you're working towards. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think, you know, you spend the time wondering what people are thinking about you as opposed to just pre-approving yourself in anything that you're doing. It's pre-approving mm -hmm. before you get on uh, Zoom. It's pre-approving before you get on the TikTok. It's not asking permission. You know, and it's being able to really understand that your voice counts and that your message counts. Yeah. Um, that's that's the internal work you do long before you turn on the Zoom, long before you get on the uh, the the turntables, long before you get on the TikTok. There's internal work that has to take place, and so now I'm understanding that this form of communication actually works before I get into the studio with you, because by the time we get to the studio, you're just externally showing what you think about yourself. So now it's helping me to create a methodology um, uh, and also helping me to understand that the difference between activity and productivity. I say yes more now, right? Cause I got the time before, <laughs> I you know, before I, I think, you know, it was like, again, you eat what you kill. So I was flying here and, and, and going to overseas. And, and so I could not say yes to everything, but now, there is so, and, and you have to be broken of the habit of thinking that productivity means success, right? The fatigue equates to the fact that you must be doing it right, mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking a little bit more smart and mm -hmm. understanding that you can reach more people the more you're fueled. Mm -hmm. And so, I think now in this space, I might never go back to the studio. <laughs> I like that, you know, and, oh. and so, what'd you say? I think that that's important. I think some of us have all said those things like, 
I might not ever have to do this anymore. So I do think that it, it is creating, um, I, I know we use the word new normal, but I think it's also just creating a sense of us all evolving. And I believe the more you learn, the more you earn. And yeah, so and, and just to say, instead of you don't wanna use new normal, it's a new muscle. I yeah. think in these times we've each yeah had to figure out, I mean, and they already existed within us. They were just lying dormant. You know, this gift of being able to reach these people, this gift of being able to, um, you know, softly pivot when we needed to, we've never been required to. So yeah. it's like these, all of these skill sets have been lying dormant. And so I think now I'm building this muscle um, so that when I do, if, you know, when the world does open back up, not only can I um, uh, be be a value in that space, but I can be a value in this space, yeah. and not sh and not kind of like um, make myself smaller. Even when asked, can I speak virtually to yeah. three thousand people? Correct. Now I'm ready. I'm That's ready. Now. Yeah, you know and, and you know, folks can get that book, right? They can get your book. Um, I do yes. want to talk. I, I know, okay. right? Thank you, it's KJ. Okay. I, I got mine too, right? I got mine. Vincent, you um, have yes, Vincent. I'm gonna send you one. Mike, you have yours. Mike, we got to send you one. Uh, <laughs> one. Uh, already, everything's on Amazon, but uh, on my camera. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> We all got books because, you know, this is, you know, we believe, I, be, I do believe that, you know, that's all I did as part of my thing is I bought a lot of books from um, a lot of authors, Black authors. So I, I read like three books at a time, but that's just my thing. Oh, you're so I, smart. Do. I know. I, I'm a, I'm, Quietly, I'm a little nerd. I love to read, like really, really love to read. So, um, Mike, I do want to talk about vulnerability. I know we've got, um, we have a few more minutes, but I definitely want to talk about vulnerability and really bring that subject back up because I do believe in this space that we are in, it is about being vulnerable. It is about being authentic in who we are. I think we've used that word, but I think pandemic has forced us to be more vulnerable. Um, with who we are and who we start um, and not be and not apologize for that, not apologize for being a black business and being a black woman and being a black man. And so I think you touching on dancing from the point of um, masculinity, that you are committed to making sure that, um, you know, that black male dancers that can be masculine um, as dancers. So I wanted to talk to you about that because the thing that you brought up was it's because men are not typically able to be vulnerable and women are. So Mike, if you can just um, share a little bit about that, that would be great. I would definitely say that from personal experience and just from what I've seen, the biggest vulnerability that you will see for a man or a black man comes out of frustration or anger. Um, it's never been condoned, especially within the black community, that a black man can just be sad. You know, um, especially within a lot of households that a lot of black men grow up in, it's usually shunned. Like, don't cry. Like, be strong. You know, black boys don't get a chance to be boys. They don't get a chance to really be vulnerable as children. Um, so I definitely think even when it comes to, like, just the arts in general, um, there's always this persona of I got to be hard, I got to be tough, I got to be this, I got to be that. Like, I think this. There's a level of understanding within that, but at the same time, that can also be toxic because if you think consistently, I can't let my guard down, I gotta be like this, I gotta be like this. Ultimately, you still pass down stuff onto your offspring and to the people around you and you're like, well, maybe I can't be open about my emotions. So with me specifically, um, I took contemporary and modern dance um, through our high school. Now my background is I'm a street dancer. Um, nobody really taught me how to move. Um, I pretty much came up how I came up, like I was taught by the street. Dances I was taught by the street in general. So I never had an appreciation for like some of the quote unquote finer arts, um, mainly because it predominantly was made up of Caucasians and it wasn't a very welcoming community. But within my senior year of high school, um, I decided to take contemporary and it changed my life forever um, mm -hmm. because that was in connection of another style that I have, which is just flex, like, which is a very street, it's, it's like a dance of war because I am a competing those. So that sense of aggression is always there. Realize that contemporary and do these beautiful, slow movements that are also very powerful, but still like exude like my own masculinity. Like once you can become comfortable in your own masculinity, 
nothing else really determines like you don't let anything else determine um how masculine you are how strong you are um because i know myself i'm mentally strong i'm physically strong because i do box and i also know that just within contemporary it's not easy either it still requires a lot of strength and emotional strength because you're also telling a story you know and also telling other people stories. Mm. so um, i would definitely say that's a level of um, that a lot of people especially black men will be able to strive to just get yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mike, we love oh, that. Um, and I say that I so appreciate you for sharing that because I do believe that as there is a market to be able to implement art forms into the business world and making sure that people really understand it. The question I'm going to um, ask you um, all, and I just really want to ask it um, really quickly because uh, I know we have a few minutes. Do you think that the world values art? And when I say art, I'm talking about music. I'm talking about dance. Do you do you believe that um, that the world in its entirety values art? And I'm going to go quickly to um, KJ. I do. I think that you know, art is a mechanism of unity. I think that you know, when I listen to songs like "Bigger Picture" by Lil Baby or songs um, by Trey Songz. Uh, that have now spoken to this time. Um, I think that it, there is power to uh, un the, the reveal of the, the, the condition of the heart. Um, and so I think if they didn't value it before, there is a value to it now because everybody is looking for something to hold on to for a level of comfort, you know, or something to use um, as an outlet. Um, and so I, I believe that it's always been valued on a, on a, uh, a probably a smaller scale, but now it has just become wow. a little bit more appreciated by all because, because now we've had a, a, a moment to sit and rest yeah. and, and yeah. see what we need. Yeah. Like a lot of times you don't even know what you need until it comes. Yeah. And so whether it's music, whether it's dance, whether it's seeing little girls, you know, be po uh, poetic laureates, to speak about what's happening. They, we are now in your face. You now have to sit down and hear how people are, are dealing with their trauma. And it is in the form of art. And art is, it doesn't have to be this very small um, way of interpretation. You know what I mean? Art can be you getting on the news and, and doing what you do as a, a newscaster. Art is what each of you guys do. You know what yeah. I'm Art is this. Yeah. Yeah. Art is, we're all artists, you know, yeah. Again, wherever you occupy space, that is your art, that is your stage. Yeah. So I think now people are understanding that there's a wider range to us artists that, yeah. that exist. I agree. That Mike, do you think the world values art? I believe that the world values art. I believe that the dominating class values art that they can control because there's a narrative among a lot of predominantly black artists, whenever they sign to these labels, they don't necessarily get to talk about everything they want to talk about. Um, I think if it wasn't for like this immense movement that's going on, if any black artist chose to speak out on something like this, I believe they would slightly get censored. Um, I think the only reason some black artists are able to speak out on this topic is because it's so large at the time right now. There are many artists who had to be independent for a long time to just talk about what they actually want to talk about, especially pertaining to the brand. Um, I would definitely say with some of these record labels um, from, from the personal offers that I've had um, just online, they were like, hey, you can't talk about this. And that's one thing that I don't want to do because I'm not going to fit anybody's there. I'm going to speak my truth. Um, yep. So I definitely feel like the world I use art, but the dominating class that can control the production and funds a lot of money behind this art, they want their they want their art to fit. So I would, it's appreciated, but I also say art. Thanks all. And um, we're becoming the dominating class, Mike. We're, we're becoming the dominating class. So yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. Um, Vince, any words around that? Do you believe that the world values are? Well, I, I'll give my own spin to it, which is I, I think that you've seen something emerge from DJs with no dance floor. Uh, DJs, a thousand percent of the time have to worry about the dance floor unless you're playing a lounge where it's just kind of background music. But you're, if you're at the party, at the club, everything is about the dance floor. And I've been in some amazing DJ sets where like it's a Prince tribute and you're hearing 17 different versions of a Prince song that you would have never heard if it were a live Prince tribute type of thing. So 
Uh, for myself, when it's time to get it in at a virtual party, I'm going in with the hits. But what this has been able to do for me is maybe play a different version of the song during the hits or have a Sunday event or a Tuesday event where I'm playing music that people have never heard before, that I wouldn't have that same platform. And people are saying, thank you for introducing me to this music. But I'm saying thank you to the other DJs that I've heard on Twitch and other platforms have these sets where I'm like, I've never heard this version. I've never heard this song, that sort of thing. We would not have that, like KJ said, without this time that people have to focus their attention in, in one spot. So we're not worried about VIP service and bottle service and who's drinking what and all of that. We're right here now. And the, uh, the computer, the laptop, the tablet, the big screen has our full attention and we can do some things art wise and music wise that we couldn't do in a different physical environment. Yeah. Can I say one more thing, um, Loretta? Yes. Go ahead. I was, I was going to say art is really just connectivity, right? Yeah. And so, it, and, and everyone has their personal way of displaying art. Yeah. But I think that's why, that's what brings yeah. so much um, focus now to art because everybody wants to connect in mm -hmm. some way. Yeah. And and that's why you can have Vince and D Nice and and Trauma and MOS and Kiss and everybody going at the same time because it is still their very personal way of connecting. Mm -hmm. And and it all counts, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it that's, does. that's what I you know. And, and yeah. I think the world, I mean, I think the business community needs to value it. Um as a business, you know, we're we are in this we are in the place of making sure that these stories are being told. And so I do agree about making sure that it is a, it is connectivity, but the way that the business world sees art is very different. And so I think us being able to have this conversation and have this round table discussion to really shape that all of you all are content creators and that's an important element to how to shape a story. So mm -hmm. to have a good experience you have to be able to have music. You've got to have dance. You know, you have to have all these elements that really makes an experience. And so it's a, it's very vital. Um, in our final words, I can't believe that we've talked. <laughs> I always, I'm always amazed. I'm sitting here. I'm like, oh my gosh, we only have five minutes. And I just yeah. enjoy, I enjoy connecting to amazing thought leaders, influential yeah. Um, leaders, influence, just, I, I just love it. And so, and to bring this to the forefront so that others can hear it and, and see the power of our voices, because you all have incredible voices in the marketplace. So I do want to ask this question as we close is what final words, you know, as we talk to this, can we, can you add that you haven't added or reinforce on how we can continuously use art, what entertainment in this workplace. So how can we ensure that black entertainers are important to the workplace right now? Because what you all know is that right now, you know, it's the state of black businesses. What I don't want to go away is that it's also making sure that black artists, black content creators are also in, as part of this ecosystem. And so with that, I wanna ask you what final words do you want to add um, around entertainment in the workplace? And I'm gonna shift to DJ Vince Adams for that. Yeah, two things super quick. One for the, the content receiver the, or the audience, just for them to remain open. A lot of people are trying to like force fit. I can't wait to get mm -hmm. back or whatever. Mm -hmm. Remain open. There's some new things happening and be receptive of the art. The second thing for the creator, they might look at KJ and say, I don't have a book or Mike and say, well, how can I get 100,000 plus followers events? Like, I don't know that technology. Everybody has something to offer. Everybody has a level of innovation within themselves. So find what's special to you and then bring that out. You don't have to copy what you've already seen as successful. This is an opportunity to create an entirely new roadmap and you can be on your own road and people will follow. And I just always say, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Mm. Um, I'm going to go to Mike. Mike, final words around that. For the artist, I would definitely say be unapologetic within your art. Also, be tactic and realize that everything you 
say definitely echo throughout history, especially with everything we have going on right now. If you're going to say something, stand behind it, backtrack on it, and be very aware of the information. Um, awesome. Okay, Mike, I, I want to make sure. Okay, Kiana, go ahead. Um, I just finally want to say that in order to, to move with the level of vulnerability, in order to tell your story in a concise and explicit way, you have to understand what your force is. That force is the thing that you never ask permission for to anyone for you to exude. That force is your light. That force makes you come alive. And that force will help you to move in a business and move in areas that um, people will see. They don't. You don't even have to say a word. People will see, but they can also tell when you're moving with timidity. They can also tell when you're unsure and uncertain. So the minute that you walk in that force, understand that it is the gift that you were born with and, and your skill sets, are never, they never have to be qualified, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to qualify them. You've got to pre-approve them first. And I believe yeah. that people will come to you. They will be driven to that because nobody wants to partner with someone that kind of thinks that they've got something to offer. You've got to stand in it. You've got to abide in it. You've got to understand that you have light and walk in that light yeah. every moment that you can. Yeah. Thank you guys. Um, thank you so much. I just want to say really quickly, I know I've put the handles there. Do you guys have, I know, um, DJ Vince Adams, you got a 50th birthday virtual party. Yes, happy birthday. Um, so we all will be there celebrating with you um, for that. For those that are listening, you want to check out Vince Adams. He's doing a 50th celebration tomorrow. Can you just give him a give a little blurb on how they can catch catch you? Sure. Everything is on Twitch, twitch.tv slash DJ Vince Adams starting at 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. KJ. I gotta say 3 p.m. Yeah. Pacific, even though KJ is back in Chicago. She <laughs> always gets at me for not putting the Pacific. I'll be like, what about us? I gotta think about this. Okay, yes. Thank she you, did the man. same to me. She was like, wait, what time? And I was like, oh shoot, oh shoot. So you're right. We got right, Miss. We over here on the central side. And she's like, oh, I was like, oh my gosh. Okay, KJ, okay. what's going on? Yes, um, you I am currently um, an author. Um, and you can find the book on Amazon, both paperback and ebook. You can also find it on Barnes and Noble, Nobles um, ebook as well. Uh, I am on Instagram at KJ Rose Effect. I'm on TikTok as Rose Effect 20. Mike, I need to chat with you on that so I can find you. Um, okay. And uh, and Facebook, Kiana KJ Rose Henson. Perfect. Um, Mike, just come into the. I want to make sure everybody here yeah. and how um, to connect to you. What do you have going on so people can continue to follow? what you have going on. Cause I just believe that, you know, you came on here, but I know in a few years, we are gonna be like, Mike <laughs> was our man. And he was on the first, you know, that he was on every yes. crisis. <laughs> we gonna yep. say that and he was on here. So I know this is just That's the fine. beginning of some awesome things that you have. So please share. For sure. Um, you can follow me on TikTok at official Gico, G I C zero E. It's the same as my Instagram handle, official Gico, G I C zero E. I respond to messages and DMs. I'm a choreographer. If you would like to book me, my booking email is in the bio of my Instagram. Um, come with a price list and your full budget ready. Everybody. Um, I love it. I love it. I love you all. Thank you all for just spending y'all Friday with me. I know we had to rearrange some things and I, I love you all for just being patient with us Appreciate and to allow for us to do this. Cause I feel like today Vince was the perfect day for us to do it. I don't know why <laughs> <laughs> it all just worked out that it was supposed to be the kick -off <laughs> birthday celebration. So um, thank you all. I love you all, all dearly. Mike, I now love you. Um, but then <laughs> I love you from my, my music. <laughs> I love you. You, my soul. I love you. Friend. I love you all. Thank you all for your greatness. And I will see you all soon. Thank you all. Blessings to everybody. Bye. Bye. Happy, birthday. Everybody. Happy birthday. Thank you, Kate. Mike. It's nice to oh. meet you. Wait, let me uh, close out. So thank you guys for tuning in for another episode of Crisis Currency Converse <laughs> and Conversations Roundtable. Uh, please subscribe to my channel at Larvetta Lofton, where um, you will get more episodes. Again, we promise to bring you 
original, rich content that will help empower you and help you through this dual crisis that we are faced with both pandemic and racial injustice. Till next week, be blessed and thank you.